Good morning. We're here for another episode. And today we have a listener that has joined us and filled out a submission on our website, adoptionthemakingofme.com. So let's introduce Lisa King. Welcome, Lisa. Lisa. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Earlier, just thank you for the opportunity to put all these pieces together and share with other like minded. Uh, people who I know have experienced a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. So without further ado, um, I was born in 1957. And so now I'm 65 years old. Um, I was born in Washington, D.C. to uh, a young unwed college sophomore who put herself in um, unwed mother care, as they said. Um, I, she relinquished me immediately. That was the plan. And for the next six months, I was in a couple of different foster care um, situations. Um, And then I was adopted by my, um, my adoptive parents in Richmond, Virginia. And this was six months later. Um, They couldn't have children, but really wanted two children. So two years later, they adopted um, a brother, my brother, my adoptive brother, who has never been much like me. We've never been close as siblings, completely different worldviews, politics, religion, everything. He'd never had an interest in finding out his roots, um, but I have continued through my life to kind of explore all those lost selves and what happened and how, how adoption has impacted my life. Um, I always felt like the black sheep in my family um, didn't know why they didn't tell me I was adopted till approximately third grade. And um, I, I never felt like I fit in, in, in my early years. And um, I had many um, uh, elementary school situations that kind of echo that not belonging feeling. And I think I shared one of them with you all when I wrote in that um, I remember going to um, first grade and um, at the end of the day, I'd come home and sit under my desk, which I still have because it's an, an antique and I inherited it. But I would sit under my desk and just cry and cry and cry because I didn't look like anybody in my family. And my best friend, whose name was also Lisa, um, looked exactly like her parents. They both had red hair. They both had pointy noses. I mean, the whole nine yards. And I couldn't I couldn't reconcile this. And I don't know if my parents told me then or if it was actually later that I was adopted. Um, but that that was kind of my experience growing up was always not understanding and feeling sort of like a misfit, um, not matching other people. Um, you know, I, I really believe my life story is one of abandonment. However, I have I have struggled throughout life in abandoning myself over and over and over again, distrusting myself, distrusting my intuitions, um, my knowledge, giving up myself or or in search of, I think, unconditional love and um, also looking in the wrong places for those kinds of things, just trying to belong and fit. Um, I really I like how you said that abandoning yourself. I don't know that I've it, never thought of it that way. Oh my goodness. It, it's, it, it's a core of me. I mean, somebody else me too. abandoned us at birth or whenever, but I have continued and I've been through probably a third of my life has been in therapy, trying mm-hmm. to figure all these pieces Same. out and, and trying to reintegrate all these orphans that, that I have inside of me partially do, I think, to the, to the adoption. And, and yes, one of the themes has been the abandonment of my own self in search of something outside of myself that I needed to find, I have needed to find inside me. Mm-hmm. So it has been a, um, a story of, a, of abandonment, I think. I, I heard something interesting the other day that, yeah. you know, there's a difference between fitting in and belonging. Like mm. you can fit in, but that sense of belonging is, is yes. seems to be the elusive thing. Yes. Because I think that chameleon aspect of adoptees Uh, being able to fit in, in any group, you know, that's right. Never really feeling like you belong. Yeah. 
finding a niche where I could be a, a part of, but not really being a sense of it. And, and a lot of that came out in my teenage years, I think, when um, I was trying to be a bad girl, but I think I was really a good girl. Yeah. And, so, and I'd follow the crowd. I started doing drugs and alcohol at 13 years old. You know, I was hanging out with um, girls who seemed to know how to to be in relationships with boys. And I never did. Mm. I was always the one that was um, looking for a boyfriend, looking for a connection, but it wasn't returned in the same way. Mm. Um, yeah, same. I, I seemed to always be the one who was helping my friends hook up with, with a relationship, but it was secretly me that wanted the relationship. And I, I, I just didn't know how to do it. I had so much fear of intimacy and distrust, and I felt ashamed of my fear. Mm. If that makes sense, it was it does. like I, I didn't feel like what they were doing was right for me. Yet I felt like I should be doing it because everybody else is doing it, meaning whatever. Really, um, so sex, how how was your relationship with your adoptive parents? Um. It took many years to be okay. I mean, when they did tell me I was adopted, which I think was at third grade, not when I was crying under my desk, but I think it was later. You know, I got the story about being chosen, but I never bought it. I, I <laughs> really never bought it. <laughs> the other side of that story, of course, is feeling um, fatally flawed. I mean, yeah. absolutely must have been unlovable for her to give me up. And I really, you know, my adoptive family was a wonderful middle-class loving um, couple. I, I grew up in an extended family of educated, um, intelligent, thoughtful artists and craftsmen and, you know, parents who are engineers, et cetera. But I was the problem. I mean, I really was awful as a teenager and <laughs> had many troubles into adulthood, still, still struggling, I think in, in some ways, but I mean, I gave them a hell. I really did. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I never felt like I belonged to them. I did you, did your brother give them hell too? <laughs> no, no, I was the outcast and he never had, as I said, never any interest in finding his, his biological parents, no struggles, seemingly you know, very fluid, even going live, a lot of denial, I must yeah. say. Um, but, and I think that's why we, we had trouble even getting along because I was always in search of something, something was missing. And I, I, I didn't know what it was. So, so if we fast forward a little bit, um, at age, I think it was 21, I opted to get the unidentifying into information from the children's home society. Um, where my mother had placed me, I guess. Um, I don't really understand how that works. The unwed mother care or organization, how that's connected to Children's Home Society or the Catholic Charities or whatever. I guess they're two separate separate parts here. Um, uh, but anyway, at 21, I got that unidentifying information. It was a page and a half on my mother and about two sentences about my father. And my mom had been, like I said, a college student. Um, she, um, she loved this man dearly, who was 26 years old. He was an artist and was a, 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 in the Marine Corps, um, about to finish a tour of duty. And he had a fellowship to study art in Paris. And she knew, it says she knew that her love wasn't returned to the same degree and that if she told him that she was pregnant, mm. that he would give up his fellowship and, and stay for the marriage, which in the papers, it says she knew it wasn't the basis for a sound marriage. So she opted to put me up for adoption versus telling this man who she'd loved for years that um, she was having a baby. And this is, I've struggled with this for many years. I mean, I have two opposing feelings, it's like, well, good for her for standing up for knowing that it wasn't a relationship that had any longevity, probably, and that she decided to do this 
without his knowledge. On the other hand, you know, I've never searched for him. There was no idea. This was a closed adoption. She never told him. She went back to her life. I, I really, for all these years, have felt like I don't have any, I don't have any options for finding him. So I've let that go. What, what about DNA now? I'd be 91, he'd, wouldn't he? He'd, he'd be about 91. Ooh, 91 yeah. So I don't know if that's something I really want to devote energy to. It, it's interesting, though, because I became an artist um, <sighs> as I grew up. So there's that, you know, there's that pull. Um, but, you know, when I read that, that those papers, I have to read it to you because um, I've read them so many times I can just about recite, you know, what, what, they, what it says. But it said that Lisa's mother is unmarried. Her father does not know of her existence. The mother believed that marriage wasn't possible now because of his plans to study as an artist in Paris. She didn't tell him. She requested adoption placement on the basis that adoption was best, that it offered the baby a normal home experience with a mother and father. Her, rec her decision included a recognition of the difficulty for herself of keeping Lisa an illegitimate child. Mm. Oh my God. When I heard that word, those words for the first time, I mean, I felt, I felt a severing that was so deep and wounding. I mean, illegitimate to me mm -hmm. is... Another. That's an awful word. Awful to, uh, word. to a to to label a human being. Oh, yeah. You get wiped off the face of the earth by mm -hmm. just the, the, the mere mention of that word. I know. It was horrible. I spent a lot of time in therapy on on, mm. on that very idea. And but, I'm wondering, I'm wondering too, like yeah. someone's taking this in the second person, you know, taking down these notes because my biological mother also chose to relinquish me. And okay. I, I can't meet her because she's not alive, but I think what was really, I mean, it sounds so prepackaged in a way. I don't know how to it say does. that correctly. No, no, I, I agree. And the more I'm understanding about the culture and the society of the time, you know, it makes me wonder about these caseworkers. Yes. Pressure. My mom, my mom never, uh, I don't think she ever chose to tell her own parents because mm. it says they were good church going people. Yeah. <laughs> 1957, you know, um, college girl gets herself pregnant. That's and right. Puts herself in the unwa so yeah. Well, it's and also, also like she, Oh, she knows it's best for him. Like, I wonder if there's a little pressure there too. Pressure. That's just, you Absolutely. might know more to the story, but to, that's well, how it I, sounds. But I, but I've read it within that context of, you know, knowing that those caseworkers were often restrictive and mean and, and mm -hmm. just downright cruel in some ways, very pressurizing. And so I, I don't really know what her true, her true nature was or her true feelings about this adoption were. But um, so, yeah, so it does make me wonder. Um, so I lived with the two pages. That was fine until... I had my own two children, my two biological children. And when they were born, both of them, I felt like they came out of me and I instantly knew them. Yeah. And I think I read this or heard this from other people as well, but I felt like I knew them inside out. Yep, that's who you are. Okay, I've known you for nine months. Uh, I immediately wanted to lick them all over, almost like <laughs> animals do. It was a weird, and you know, my husband and I at the time were like, this is freaking weird, but that's, you yeah. know, that's what I felt like. And I couldn't imagine how my own biological mother must have felt when that mm. occurred, that instant severing, you know, of, of this person that she'd known for nine months. And for me, the person I'd known and felt hormones, feelings, cycles, everything for nine months, how traumatic that really, really must be. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I must mention here, one of the, one of the um, people I follow um, in my spiritual growth, I guess you'd say is a, a Hungarian uh, MD and psychologist named Gabor Mate. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. He I is. Trauma. Wow. I know. Trauma I don't know. 
think I'm addicted to him. Yes. But he, you know, anyway. him and Paul Sunderland too is pretty. Oh, I like Paul. Yes. Yes. And they speak so eloquently about the the traumas that traumas that lead to addictions, especially traumas of childhood, of of fetuses in the womb, and not trauma in terms of what happened to you, like big PTSD. Right. This is, this is, and I think I can quote him in saying that trauma is what you do with what happened to you, what you do inside of yourself uh. in response to the things that happen to you. And I really, I've, I've never had any major traumatic, you know, abuses in my family or, you know, things like that. But I remember many, many microaggression type things that my response to them, I think, has 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 often related to that initial severing and um, abandonment right after right after birth. I'm glad you're bringing that up because I I think in conversations I've had with people, they think, oh, you have to have this big thing happen to you to have a trauma and you beat yourself up inside from things we don't even know. I mean, no. well, I'd say being relinquished at birth is a it big is trauma, big, but, I think, but I don't think right. others see it that way. Right. I mean, no. we're educated. I mean, well, people. they would see it if a, if a, if, yeah. if a mother died yeah, they you know, would. in childbirth uh, or a mother died in a car accident and the child was, right. was taken exactly. away, that is trauma, but they don't seem, I think right. that's changing though. I do Obviously too. I the culture so. has changed and right. it's being recognized and talked about it and moved into the mainstream a little more. And, and I think that's true um, because look at all the research and the books that are out on adoption itself now. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Finally. You're right. It, it's like, it's when you're a fetus or a newborn child, um, you don't have the language or the words to make sense of what's happening to you. So of course that stuff is internalized. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I can think of many, many incidents in my childhood that were just minor little infractions of, you know, somebody called me a name or I was a chubby little kid. And I was, my <laughs> uncle used to call me biscuit bottom or whale tail. <laughs> well, guess what? guess what? I had, I developed many eating disorders, anorexia, bulimia throughout my, my young adult years, reconciling those kinds of little things. So I totally believe in Gabor Mate's, you mm. know, studies of mm -hmm. what, what trauma really is and what it can do to a person. And I also think that severing and relinquishment must have affected my mother throughout her adult life as well. And I'll tell you why. Um, so after the, the, um, after my children were born, I embarked on the fee-based search with Children's Home Society. I wanted more information. And um, it took about four years. And they finally let me know that they had found that she died of emphysema, of health issues, et cetera. But they did find a half brother. Actually, they found three half brothers. And so they connected me with my oldest half brother, who I went out to Rhode Island and met. Did, did all years. three half brothers have the same father? Yes. Okay. My mother had gotten actually married five years later to her boss, an executive in some big firm. It sort of it sort of reads like um the 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 season, the um uh, what's it called? Madman. Madman, exactly. <laughs> I've seen pictures of she and her husband together and the bouffant hair and the, she was the secretary and event planner for this high powered executive. So they got married, had three boys. Um, but my half brother told me that he, he had always felt like he had a sister out there somewhere, but he didn't know why. He also shared with me that my mother had told the three boys at some point that she'd had a little girl who had died in childhood. Oh. And I don't know if she meant she'd had me, probably, this was probably me, but had me before the marriage or she had me during the marriage or whatever, but, but, but it's couched in secrets. 
and shame. Um, my brother told me she also struggled with many addictions and mental health issues throughout you know, her, her life with the family, et cetera. She never told the husband that he knows of, that he knows of. He never told that she never told my brothers. So, you know, I've got to believe that this woman lived in mm. a, a lot of torture, a lot of shame and the aftermath of, of 1957 and what, what happened. What she chose. It's like she wanted to talk about having you, but had to make it so that you weren't alive. Right. Right. So that it it might have been easier. Ironically, um, another severing incident here. Um my brother, my half brother told me that she had died um in August of 1992. And during that month, I was in a horrific, this is a trauma trauma. <laughs> a horrific boat accident in which I was just a passenger and my leg was severed. Oh my gosh. But yeah, in an instant, you know, I became oh an Oh my empty. gosh. Wow, Lisa. And, you know, this may see, sound a bit far-fetched, but it, it really resonates with me. This happened at, in the very month that that I lost my mother too. And, and I liken it to the same or similar severing kind of experience I had in childbirth, where one minute, you know, one reality and the next yeah. minute, your total, your total reality has changed and there's no going back. Severing is a violent, mm. um, permanent separation. And I see a birth similar to that. And, and this traumatic accident changed the course of my life as well. And you know, call it synchronicity, coincidence, whatever. But I, I really feel like it was a connection to some kind of bigger macrocosm about, about my life. Yeah. A, a real metaphor, really. I mean, real metaphor. Yeah. The timing's unreal. The timing, it was really unreal. So, so severing has been sort of a, a theme, you know, for me throughout life as well. Um, let me think what else I was going to tell you about that. My other two brothers really had no interest in knowing me. In fact, told, told me not to contact them. Um, but I'm still in contact with my half brother. And, um, oh, interestingly, uh, you all may not have heard about this incident, but back in, I don't know, early nineties anyway, um, there was a debacle within this crematorium in Kentucky or Tennessee. And it was called the tri-state crematorium i sort of remember this okay so, so here here you go um so so my brother says after my mom died um the fbi came to the came to his door a year or so later and they told him about this tri-state crematorium debacle and they said it's possible that the ashes you have uh. of your mom are not her ashes because this crematorium had been piling up the bodies and you know oh, not God. not burying them and filling the, the urns with dirt and crap like that well so my brother shows me this picture of my mom dead covered in a blanket and her feet are sticking out with two <laughs> slippers on and the slippers have bunny ears and she demanded that when she died she be buried in these bunny slippers and the ears, of course, are, are hold, held up by wires inside of them. And so my brother tells the FBI agent, well, let's go look in the urn because she was buried with her bunny slippers on. And if those wires are in the urn, we'll know that that's the real mom. And sure enough, they looked in the urn and her bunny slipper wires were, were in the urn. So he's rest assured that that's his, that is our, our real mom that they got back from the truck. So she had moved to the South, I'm guessing at Pardon some, me? did she move yes. to the South at some point? Yeah. yeah. Somewhere, somewhere in that area. I can't remember the, the, the moving that that family did, but yes. And so I, I, sa yeah. I sadly know about the story because my brother, my adopted brother, he has sick humor. And yeah. when my mom passed, you know, he, he reads all this stuff. He's like, remember, yeah. you know, we may get, remember what happened in Kentucky? Yes. 
And I, I was like, wait, I know it. this story. <laughs> right. And I heard of this story up in Minnesota where yeah, I was like, it was you know, creepy. Was like, yeah. This is crazy. And so I have seared in my brain this picture of this dead corpse with a blanket over her and two bunny <laughs> ears. <laughs> Gee. Humor, but okay, so, so um <laughs> so then your you you did your search and you had your two kids and and um and you've kept in touch. And you've kind of been, you know, started, when did you start coming out of the fog as, as they say? God, I think I'm still in the fog. Um, no, <laughs> um, I think after my children were born and I actually got to meet my brother, a lot of my need was satisfied, a, a, a somewhat closure. Um, but I, you know, I continue searching I, I'm not even I continue searching I think for figuring out as I said all those orphan selves I mm. you know I, I still feel her presence kind of come up in me m many many times and um, I'm sure I'm reading things into it but but I really you know, I, I'm much like my adoptive family on the outside. I mean, I'm, I'm educated. I'm a, I was a craftsperson. I was pro a professional for, in disability services for many, many years. Um, my extended family is all craftspeople and very outgoing and, and engaged in things. Um, but my inner self is still, I believe, really quite fragile. And a bit still uncentered, I, I would say, you know, I still go to therapy and I still look for different ways to respond to things that happen to me and, and respond to the world. I, my, my initial um, view of the world, I think sometimes is still in fear and insecurity and, um, looking for pieces that I need to be finding in myself that I think I found a lot of, um, but, but uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how, how much better to describe that. Um, and what, do you, do you think you might ever seek your father? May, like, I mean, probably the odds of him being alive are probably slim, but just in terms of finding out who he was and I that feel like you should. I'm, I'm still very, very curious about that. You know, this guy went to Paris to study arts. You know what? Who was he? I mean, you know, and did he ever think that he he had a child? Uh, yeah, that part is and, really. And you don't know for sure that he doesn't know that she was pregnant. You just right. well, she said she didn't tell him. Right? Well, yeah, she but... not... yeah, she she did not tell him. Um, but yeah, I don't, let me see. I feel like that you have a, a limited time as Sarah likes to remind me about things. Yes, you know? yes. please, please do remind <laughs> me. We, we can do it together. Even you have some siblings possibly, you know? I, I do, I do. On I, his side, I mean. On, on his side, yeah. And it's possible that he's still alive. So I it may- It is possible, so- yeah, you may as well spit into that tube and send it off. <laughs> I know. Let the chips fall where they may. Thank and, you. <laughs> yeah, many years ago, I, I couldn't do that. So, yeah. you know, I think that is a possibility now. It, it would be interesting to to find that out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, will you keep okay. us posted, please? I will. I absolutely will. I love your, um, just, your, the, you know, how deep you go with this and, and all your, like, I, I'm still processing what you told us about your boat accident. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. Well, Did that lead you into disability work. No. Um, ironically, I had chosen disability work as a graduate study. So I was already in graduate school and then had the boat accident. So we would fast forward. I do a lot of speaking and then mentoring of amputees, et cetera now, but ironically, you know, it was like, I chose that profession, but the profession but, found me as well. Right. That's so, that is ironic. There's I so mean, many layers to your story. Really? 
And it, it, it really did become a, vo a vocation for me because I could be a very authentic, my very authentic self with students telling them to get their ass to class and shut up. Who cares if you have ADD, you know, get on with it. On the other hand, I could tell them, yeah, that building doesn't have an elevator and you're in a wheelchair. Let's go do something about that. Where's the president? Yeah. You know, yeah. Right. So um, I think that accent actually helped me become more of my true self than many, many other things. Um, you know, I, I don't know, but, and I also shared with, with you guys a little bit about another severing, which I won't go into, but um, an abrupt um, ending of a 25 year marriage that happened just four years ago. And again, that, that kind of severing that you don't get to process or transition mm -hmm. into or anything it's just there one minute and it's not the next i mean been, just the word erupt ending after 25 years is like oh right well and and i'll i'll just say a little bit about this you know i i became an artist but most of my artwork um i did during some really intense therapy and all of my work is nothing you'd ever want to put on your living room wall like that. <laughs> we may <laughs> it is of birthing and it is of severing and it is of rebirth and transformation. So I, and I, I think a lot of it, as I look at it today, looking back, there are some literal images, I think that really relate to birth. You know, Lisa, so, did you ever think of having a show like some sort of I show had, based around severance and adoption? Um, I, I did many years ago, I went to California to um, an art therapy conference and I, I shared the whole story. It wasn't as in depth and connected to my adoption because I've learned internalized so much more now, but yes, I, I did share all of that. And it, um, is and, there and a I, way to see your artwork? Where can we see your yeah, artwork? I think it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. And my my daughter, bless her heart, she's a college student now, and she has plastered her walls and ceiling with all this work. Oh. And it's, oh. It's, it's raw. I mean, I'm telling you, it is, it's freaking raw. So, um, but, but that's yeah, art. That's okay. I think it's sellable yeah. because it really, it's pregnancy and birth and transformation. And this is all a lot not all, but a lot of it is metaphorical too, because it's therapy going on and, you know, rebirthing of myself, but it absolutely relates to my beginnings in the world. Yeah. Well, please, well, please send us see that. it. Yes. Yeah. See some so, pictures of your artwork. I, you know, I continue to um, a quest to further my understanding about my beginnings of how they've shaped and impacted my life. Um, I think I have an adoptive family who I've shared life experiences with but I also had a birth mother who was responsible for, responsible for my becoming a person at all. My mm -hmm. self-development has been a byproduct of the history. My birth mother gave me genetically and the environment that was afforded me by my adoptive family. So, well, Lisa, uh, this has really been amazing. Thank you so oh, much. Love talking to you. And, me and too. And no, I feel I, like, I feel like I want, uh, I want to keep up with you and have you do like, cool art show and we're gonna spend the two I'll, like I'll, let us know I'll, I'll figure out how to make those the the art available to you it may be i'm not technological very much either but um maybe i could send it just to the emails you sent me yeah, for sure yes and um and also keep us posted on if you decide to yeah. <laughs> do a search i we were really wanting to know thinking about it yes okay yes, keep us well, posted I will. All Thanks right. for joining us, Lisa. I really you. appreciate your generous generosity and sharing your story. Oh, you're we do. I'm following you and your, your chapter. So keep it up. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.